Okay, we've just had an election in which no mention was made of the two wars we are now fighting. Now that may seem extremely odd to you, but when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. After all, we only have two parties in this country, and one of them, the Democrats, is not too eager to remind voters that we're waist deep in the twin quagmires of Iraq and Afghanistan. That's because their leader, our president, who rode into power on the basis of his alleged anti-war credentials, is invested in those wars. He's embraced the war party, and they're all going along for the ride. After all, who cares? It's just a bunch of foreigners getting killed, right? And a few of our professional soldiers. Nothing to get too excited about. As for the Republicans, well, what can we say about them? They're the ones who got us into these wars in the first place, and they don't want to remind us of that. They don't want to remind us that they've spent three trillion, that's trillion with a T, three trillion of our tax dollars on just one of those wars, the war in Iraq. They don't want to remind voters what a horrible waste it all is, how it's endangered us rather than made us safer, and how their friends and supporters have profited from those wars, while the rest of us have paid in blood and treasure. So of course, they aren't talking about the wars. They don't want to bring up the subject, except for a lot of malarkey about how we're, we should support the troops in a very abstract way. And of course, we don't expect the Republicans to criticize the wars, because war is their favorite pastime. They worship at the altar of Ares, the war god. And their leaders are their high priests. But not all of them. Some of them have a different view, some Republicans, but we'll get to that later. For now, let's talk about the left, the very depressing left and the long, loud silence that has been their response to Obama's wars. Of course, we all remember the anti-war movement of the Bush years. George W. Bush, he was the perfect hate object, wasn't he? Stupid, narrow, born with a silver spoon in his mouth, surrounded by a coterie of rather scary-looking advisors and retainers, and seemingly dominated by the most sinister of them all, Dick Cheney. Mr. Scary. It was all so easy, easy to hate, easy to get the people into the streets, easy to bring out all the familiar slogans and run them up the flagpole. And then, suddenly, it all stopped. No more demonstrations, no more angry op-ed pieces in the New York Times, no more congressional resolutions put forward by the so-called anti-war caucus in the House of Representatives. Why is that? Well, let's play detective and look at the evidence. If we go to the website of United for Peace and Justice, the main peace organization, we can dig up an article hailing the election of Barack Obama as a great progressive victory. And I quote, what a moment, Ex with an exclamation point. What a moment. On November 4th, the voters of this country came out in massive numbers to cast their votes for change. The election of Barack Obama was the greatest repudiation of the Bush administration's policies we have seen in these long years of struggle. And what a relief it was, end quote. Now, that is the anti-war coalition, the chief coalition, uh, you know, now opposing Obama's war, supposedly. And the gushing doesn't end there. Okay, the piece goes on for paragraphs, praising the wisdom of the great leader and concluding with a quote from his victory speech. They then say that the whole struggle for peace has to be adapted to what they call this new context, quote unquote. Well, what that adaptation turned into was a complete capitulation. As Obama escalated the wars, an inch into Pakistan, United for Justice and Peace issued a pamphlet devoted to what it called solidarity with Afghanistan, 
proposing a massive reparations program, billions <laughs> in American aid, albeit demilitarized, subordinating the call for ending the occupation to this massive international welfare scheme. In effect, they endorsed the nation-building aspect of the Obama administration's counterinsurgency strategy, knowing full well that it implied support for the military operation, the former being dependent on the success of the latter. Less than a year after President Obama took office, United for Peace and Justice essentially dissolved itself, maintaining only an email list. No more conferences, no more marches, no more activism to end the occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan. After organizing for eight years against what they called Bush's War, putting on substantial demonstrations, holding five or six national conferences, and building up a network of local groups, United for Peace and Justice threw in the towel. After all, the Messiah had arrived, and Obama's wars were Bush's wars. It was the quickest and most ignominious retreat in the history of political activism. The left has made a bargain with the Democratic Party, the powers that be, and the devil himself. They'll shut up about the wars if only they can get the domestic programs, the government spending, the regulations, the social programs, the bank bailouts that they want. The public employee unions don't care one whit about someone being killed by a drone in far off Pakistan. They just want their pensions guaranteed. The civil rights groups just want to push through their domestic agenda. The gay groups just want to be able to join the armed forces, for God's sake. So all these groups, which the left imagines are their natural constituency, don't dare speak out against the war. They don't bite the hand that feeds them. They go along to get along. And so the war goes on. Oh, of course, they don't say that. They don't acknowledge that they've made a deal with the devil. After all, people have to live with themselves. They have to believe that they're moral. They aren't monsters. They're not selfish. So they come up with a rationale 